question. So welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a good lunch. And um, we are going to be talking about what next for the future of university accommodation. Um, I'm going to introduce our panel before we get started. So um, we've got Ed Naylor from uh, Liverpool John Moores. He's the head of accommodation there. Jane Crouch, who is Chief Operating Officer from Fresh Student Living. Robin Walsh, Head of Residential Accommodation at Bournemouth. John Wakeford, who's the Director of Engagement from UPP. And Sally McGill, who's Chief Financial Officer and Deputy CEO from Staffordshire University. And my name is Victoria Tommy Liverseed from Unipol. Um, so thank, I want to start by thanking our panel for uh, coming to talk about it coming to talk about this topic. Um, so we're going to be looking at what's next for the future of university accommodation strategies in a time of economic and post-COVID uncertainty. And we've certainly heard a lot about that this morning, haven't we? I think it's, um, uh, it's a challenging time to be operating. And we're going to think a little bit about what role is the private sector going to play. So uh, I won't go over all of the points, replay all of the points we've already talked about, but I think it's good to think about the backdrop to this, which is that universities in the student accommodation world are always going to be the first point of contact for students, um, but the private sector is obviously playing a growing role and is becoming more important in meeting that need. But we've got significant headwinds that we've touched on a lot already today, so student changes. I've looked at the latest UCAS figures, uh, the kind of the early indications, and it does appear that undergraduate home numbers are down a bit this year, but we know that postgraduate taught students are up significantly. But the picture is quite mixed, obviously, at different universities and in different cities. But I think overall student numbers are up, but they're not necessarily the students that the sector is used to dealing with most often. Um, we've got the, the kind of the lingering effects that the pandemic had um, on expectations about accommodation and um, in-person teaching versus online and, and what that means for student expectations. We've got cost of living issues that are going to be impacting on, rent, impacting on rents um, and utilities as well. So family budgets probably feeling quite squeezed. So a really changing environment. So we thought it'd be useful to get a few people together with um, some experience, significant experience in the sector to just talk about some of these issues and how, the, um, how we might try and handle them going forward. You know, what are things gonna look like in five or 10 years time in the, in the world of student accommodation is quite a, an interesting, uh, interesting question. So I'm gonna start with, um, we have a couple of, of talking points. We're gonna run through some questions up here um, I'll probably take questions at the end, if that's okay, from the audience. Although, if you have something burning that you think, actually, they've really not thought about this, then wave and we will, we will come and find you. But the first question that the panel are going to be looking at is, um, how are universities really creating viable portfolios in the kind of post-pandemic environment? Oh, I've got some slides. Okay. Oh, there we go. So the first question we're going to be looking at is how are universities creating viable portfolios post-COVID? Um, <laughs> um, so I don't know if anybody has any opening things or, or things that they want to talk about kind of based on what we've covered so far already today. If there's anything anybody wants to start, be brave. No. Oh. Yeah, go on. Okay, go on. Um, I, I think what universities are, are, are looking for is to be able to respond to very particular needs of students who are coming through now who've had a very different experience prior to coming to university and I think what universities are looking for is a portfolio that they can explain to students in a reassuring way mm. so that's working with the private sector or using their own their own accommodation to to achieve that the you no know, people talked to you during the pandemic about you have talked about this, this morning about you know will will the in-person experience come back yes it will but now we've got people who are not used to the in-person experience mm -hmm. because they've not experienced it at school, never mind, never mind they've, you know, they've now come to university for the first time. So I think it's about being able to offer that reassurance that this is going to be a good experience and to have a coherent portfolio that you can describe, explain, and emphasize that, it's, that it really it's about support, support for, the, for the social aspects mm. of being back on, on campus. Yeah, no, that's really, uh, does anybody have any other? 
Yeah, I just, I just think um, if you look at the different dynamics in the sector at the moment, the, the, the question is how are universities actually going to be able to get these you know, this, this development away. And I think um, over the last two decades, there have been uh, fair wins in this area. But um, if you look at what's happened to sort of even the guilt rates have moved 300 basis points by, you know, since um, turn of the year, it puts these schemes very much into sort of the questionable category, whether we'll see a hiatus in, in, in deals coming to market and student accommodation being built remains to be seen. But I guess um, some universities will be sensibly uh, thinking, well, let's wait and see what the funding uh, outlook looks like, because mm. we still have um, a bill due to go through Parliament during this session. In fact, too, the free, um, free speech bill, but also the, the funding bill. Um, and I think that that's going to be uh, critical. Um, universities had the, had the um, tuition fees uh, frozen for five years. We've got another two years of that. So universities are really struggling in terms of um, having to think about strategically um, how they change what they do. But I think those public sector, private, you know, the DBFO area is going to become critical. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I this morning on the, on the train on the way up, I, I started writing down kind of ideas of, of what the challenges were for mm -hmm. universities. I stopped. <laughs> <laughs> I stopped after I got to the end of page two. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so I, th I think there's, there, there, there's a lot going on, you know, in, in the market. And you, you talk about kind of post-COVID. Um, I mean, I, th I think COVID is just one of the, of the, of the factors. I mean, there's some have just been mentioned. Um, but the, it, it's such, you know, Martin and Sarah spoke about lots of, lots of the kind of grim realities of, of, of creating a, a viable portfolio. So I think... There's, there's, two, there's a couple of elements to it, really. There's, there's, there is about once you've kind of got your portfolio, then what, what does that look like from a service delivery point of view around student support and creating communities? But ultimately, you've got to get that portfolio first. And I think, I think actually that's emerging as the, as, as, you know, as the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think over the last few years, over the last sort of four or five years, you know, the emergence of you know, residential life programmes, mm -hmm. um, universities try, sort of working much sort of closely internally together, student support, welfare has been very much kind of at the front. Mm -hmm. Now I think it's about making sure you've just got the beds to be mm -hmm. able to meet your recruitment. And I think one of the big challenges for universities, and I certainly know this from my own experience, is um, if, you know, it kind of feels like you, your, your university is is recruiting numbers and it needs to recruit numbers for the reasons you know we talked about mm. 2016 was the last time that tuition fees were went up you know so the real value of, of university income has gone down significantly and will continue to so universities need to recruit um, but then the challenge is where they're going to live and that challenge is just kind of given to accommodation services mm. and, and said you know well find somewhere for them to live pick it up on Sarah's point when a city is full it's full and, and, and that's the challenge. Um, and it kind of feels like, you know, the accommodation service feels like you're, sort of, you're the tail trying to wag the dog. Um, but, you know, you could go on. It's, it's complicated. Mm. I'm, I'm going I'm to pass on <laughs> to see what others think. I mean, I think, um, you know, Fresh is a third party operator and we work with investors. Um, and I think if you're going to get private investment into building student accommodation, there needs a bit more joined up talking um, with universities. Um, I think um, at the moment, um, investors are going to be very reluctant to come into the market at the moment um, with the cost of um, build, um, the rental levels and the uncertainty as well as whether the students are actually going to turn up in the future. Whilst we're seeing a bit of a crisis now, is that going to continue? I think universities are often reluctant to have those conversations, don't necessarily want to sign up to anything very long term. It's all very short term. Mm. So if you use Glasgow, for example, if the university came to us and said, do you want a nominations deal? I think one of my colleagues said that earlier. We probably were, not us personally, but our investors would probably say, no, why, why do we need to have um, you know, a referral agreement? Um, but whilst you know, that's happening. We've got students that go to Glasgow University, live with us in Stirling and Paisley. So, mm -hmm. you know, whilst we've tried to do our best for them, mm -hmm. it's not probably what they thought they were going to get from the university. And, mm -hmm. you know, is that going to damage the university reputation mm -hmm. going mm -hmm. forward? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and just to echo what um, Robin was saying really about the, the, as Jane said as well, the, the need to secure your 
accommodation as, as a top priority. We've never had to worry about that in Liverpool for all the time I've been there. It's been a given, it's always been there. Um, and that's become a, a, not a challenge so much, but it's something we need to be think, focusing on. And as it happens, it's also come, become clear to us that now is the right time to be thinking about working with, our, with, with the providers on a longer term basis, because we've, I feel like we've probably reached as far as we can go with our partnerships as it stands. We, we're currently, we're, we're, I mean, for ridiculous procurement reasons, we actually work on an annual um, procurement cycle, which fortunately we've had the same group of partners for the last three years, more by luck than judgment, I think. So that's helped a bit. But I think in terms of going forward and really taking forward the agenda that we've talked about, about the, the, the student support and the mental health support, et cetera, we can't really do that the way we're doing it at the moment. And I think one of the major things within that will be uh, staffing structures and, and staffing resource in our partners, because that's become, I think, the, the limiting factor now on how far we can go with, with, with the partnership model. And I do think we need to address that. And it's, it's not easy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we, we recognize that. But unfortunately, we've, we've um, got some really, really keen and, and hardworking staff, but they don't have the time or the expertise or, frankly, the pay, pay grade in some cases in the PBSA sector to, to be relied on to, to help us with that agenda. And they will want to do that. And their companies say they want to do that. But unfortunately, we're seeing, despite what appears to be a golden age for the PBA state sector, a, a, a retrenchment and a, and a taking away of skills from staff in some, in some of our partners yeah. and a reducing, it, reducing a salary. I find it quite shocking that um, there are some providers who, who have to trumpet the fact that they are a living wage employer. Well, should they not all be living wage employers and more, frankly? Um, and also there are some providers who have told us they have discretionary funds for staff who are unable to make ends meet to take a bid for, which is great. I appreciate that's the argument, but isn't that, not, isn't that actually the yeah. solution? I do think that the de-skilling and the de, de, de not de-waging, de but the reducing salary is relevant, relatively to PBSA staff is something that does, does concern us, I think. Um, and I think something we do need to, to, we want to address as we go forward, really. I mean, I think that's something that I've talked <coughs> with you before, I think, is about the professionalism of our staff and mm. looking at ways and how we can um, train staff that you know is recognised. Uh, I think it's so important as a sector. I think it's very we're kind of undervaluing the, what the staff do. Yep. Yeah. Um, it's very multi-tasked. Uh, um, there's a lot of responsibility, um, and I think we do need to do more about having qualifications that people then can say, actually, I'm qualified. I can do this. I can do that, yep. and then therefore, mm -hmm. hopefully, it would attract the salaries that really um, they deserve. Yeah, I think there's, a, there's a, a danger of a skills drain as well at the moment in this sector, isn't there? We're seeing a lot of people being lured to build to rent. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of senior people kind of disappearing and it's, um, there's a real danger, isn't there, that we lose our experienced staff and that you know, wages aren't keeping up. To, to keep people in the sector, and yet we, I've, you know, I've had conversations with lots of people. My, my kind of personal soapbox about skills and professionalism and, and, and qualifications in the sector. And I think that if you work for a housing association, you know, you, there's a clear kind of career trajectory and, and skills recognition, but there isn't in this sector, and it's as complicated. As that, as, as that sector. Yeah, so that uh, it's not nationally organised mm -hmm. necessarily. I mean, I think mm. we, we haven't been as good as we should have been, but mm. what, we've, what we've taken to doing is having our own apprenticeship scheme. So we choose mm. uh, staff over from universities typically, mm -hmm. and they're our core team. So we have to put you know, money into sort of investing in them. Mm -hmm. But I still think there's more, more you can do in terms of you know, professionalising mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, frontline teams. Yeah, and one of the points that we kind of, uh, that I think we've kind of alluded to as well is what level of priority this is given within institutions. I think over the last five, ten years, you know, for a lot of institutions, it's been about developing the campus. Mm. Um, you know, investment has gone in, into that side of things. You know, there are issues with pensions and, you know, lots of other calls on the institution's money. But whether accommodation starts to become, starts to move up the pecking order, really, in, in terms of what the institution is thinking about, it, it needs to prioritise and focus on um, to make sure that the university continues to be viable yeah. on the model that they want, you know, whether that's attracting students. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I can actually speak to that. Um, mm -hmm. So, experience of, of Staffordshire University was, was an assumption that there was in house accommodation which had been built by the university. Many years ago, not particularly good, good, good quality, but it wasn't the big priority. There were other priorities. And now, with, with the way the market is going, we, we absolutely need better accommodation for our students. Also, the accommodation we've got is built on the floodplain. 
um, climate change is a, is a reality for us because what was thought to be a one in a hundred event where there might be a flood is probably now a one in 20, so the population has to be physically moved. Um, despite John's pessimism about DBFO, <laughs> um, I mean, I think the reality is that it's still a model which, is, which is, would be good for us because it allows us to introduce capital that we wouldn't otherwise have access to. Um, people, people might say, well, why are you, give, why are you, get, you know, not running that accommodation yourself? You know, you probably make quite a good return on it. Yes, but we haven't put away the money we need to be able to over the long term because we've been using it for other things, mm -hmm. as you say. So we haven't got the ability to refresh that accommodation or to move it ourselves. So we are looking for that external investment. And yes, guilt rates are a worry, etc. But we, well, we can't we can't sort of stop the, de the development of the university and mm. risk the student experience because because of that um, because of these issues and the other issue which we've also been grappling with because when we, we started looking at this was before the sort of inflation crisis started a little while ago was that we really want to look at the long-term sustainability of the accommodation as well mm -hmm. and we set, set out with the goal we want to achieve as good a, a, an offer we can in terms of the, the sustainability because that's what students are going to be questioning in the longer term so there might be short-term crises about you know, what's my energy bill going to be? What's my rent going to be? But in the longer term, students are then going to be questioning, well, well why did you build this if actually it's not very sustainable? Why, you know, why did you not think about the, the way that we could, we, we also could reduce our costs by having a more, mm -hmm. more efficient building? So that's, mm -hmm. but that's a massive challenge because obviously there's a premium to building a more sustainable, a, a, a carbon reduced build is a, is a you know, more expensive build. And so it's just trying to sort of sort all of these things out at the moment is quite, quite a challenge. <laughs> Yeah. I think I think that um, for those universities that can afford to invest or find the money to invest, then I think they they probably will mm. over the next few years will start to to make those decisions to to perhaps change their strategic mm. priorities um, based on kind of all the conversations of what we talked about up till now. However, there are universities that just aren't in that position, mm. and um, but actually, you know, what, I think what it what it ultimately boils down to is I think now is the time that universities need to be sitting down, and if you don't have a strategic um, approach to delivering your student accommodation, you need to do it mm. sooner rather than later. Um, you know, look at look at the look at your look at your current portfolio. Um, look, you know, if you've got your your your, your so you've got stock of your own, look at kind of, you know, what, what's the sort of lifespan of that. If you've got nomination agreements or lease agreements, you know, when do they end? Um, what, what's your recruitment looking like, um, you know, over, over that period of time as well? Um, and then who, who are you going to have to work with in order to maintain a portfolio that meets the requirements, whatever they are, whatever, whatever you decide they are? Mm -hmm. I think that's where then, then you need, that's where the private sector ultimately comes in. Um, but... Picking up on Ed's point, you know, you need to have confidence that whoever you're working with um, has, has has that sort of set of staffing and services that um, that are going to fit with um, what you want from that student accommodation. And that's about collaboration and about working, you know, ultimately trying to work as one body, mm -hmm. one in, one 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 you know one team to deliver to deliver those services. Um, so yeah, so that's I think think that's kind of ultimately where we are and that's what that's what people need to be doing um, otherwise you're not going to have a viable portfolio <laughs> right great well that's a that seems like a good point to move on to our next topic really which is um, <coughs> thinking about student demand and preference and um, how that's changing um, and you know how we can adapt to that I don't know if anybody wants to kick off on this so, are, are students I, expressing differences in what they're what they're looking for I think um, one of the things I can kind of give some feedback on is that we do an annual survey um, each year and it's surprising now that um, accommodation is now the second um, thought in a student's mind about where they're going to go and study. Mm. So accommodation is obviously very, very important. So I think when universities are going out to recruit, they do need to talk about the options Mm. and what happens after year one, you know, what, what is the accommodation like um, in the location, what's the availability, because mm -hmm. I think there's been such a lot of press now about mm. people queuing and overnight or, you know, people having to share accommodation that's quite poor. Mm -hmm. um, and we heard earlier about the HMO sector not being there anymore, um, mm. you know, that's diminishing. Um, so I think it is really, really important. And what students want now is very, very different. Um, you know, 
they do want space um, in their rooms, but they also want places to go and study. Mm -hmm. Study is really, really important now. So it's having lots of different study areas within the accommodation, not just at university. Yeah. So um, very, very different to sort of 14, 15 years ago. And when you look at first generation accommodation, it doesn't really meet the needs of students of today mm -hmm. because it's got a tiny common room and mm. one tiny little space. Um, so I think there needs to be some investment now in that first generation accommodation. Mm. You need to be losing beds to create better spaces for students. Mm. Um, to be able to kind of live and study in the way they want to now. Yeah, I think that's that, that's that's our observation at Unipol that study spaces inside buildings <coughs> are, are really important and more important than social spaces actually. That um, and um, um, and I think that's a really good point. It kind of harks back to Robin about you know if we're thinking about accommodation strategy, it's got to be for the whole across the whole mm -hmm. student lifespan, hasn't it? You know how are we going to work with the HMO market and understand need in that in that space for second and third years because it's no good getting to your third year and not having anywhere to live. That's the that's the nightmare scenario, isn't it? You, and that's probably the time you actually need it most because yeah. you're just trying yeah. to finish. You know, as well. I do. I do wonder though, like the the you know all of this comes at a cost, mm. and and you know you're looking at rental prices, mm. and I do think that uh, I think first year students potentially don't. They, I don't think they need or want that. I think the first generation model. I'm not saying they, they shouldn't be refurbished, but I think the first generation model potentially suits first years, mm. and then what you're talking about with that sort of the you know. The, the study spaces and the more communal spaces, perhaps there, you know, that's more sort of uh, for, for for returning students. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there because mm -hmm. I am concerned about like the rental, you know, levels, um, and that there needs to be a model there that 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 keeps rental levels down. Obviously, they're always going to go mm -hmm. one way, and that's up. Mm -hmm. But you know. Be yeah, so it was, so yeah, it was a key that. key exam question for us because okay, if Sarah is telling us that we've got two hundred 10 or however many it is, 1,000 first-generation rooms out there um, that, are, that are up for grabs, then that should really, they should be the ones that are being the budget offer. Uh, and, but how, how do you bring that about when you've got asset prices that are going through mm -hmm. the roof? Because it's the hot, hot property to be into, quite mm -hmm. literally, because um, it, it's safe in a world of unsafe investments, or relatively mm -hmm. safe. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what we need to work, uh, mm -hmm. work out how to do. I mean, we've managed to do something um, to meet both, I think, in Sheffield, in one of our schemes there, and um, houses students at a very kind of affordable end. So the accommodation is very, very, very first generation. Um, so the um, living accommodation is relatively basic. It's some, sometimes it's shared bathrooms. Um, but what the client there has done is actually invested in some social areas mm -hmm. to give the study areas, to give a bit of space to work out. So actually when you walk into the building and, and you see the different areas that you can share, that's really high quality, it's mm -hmm. quite good standard. But what you're doing is sacrificing to get the lower rent in the accommodation that you're actually living in. So the kitchens aren't you know, spanking new, you know, um, the bathrooms are, you know, 15, 20 years old, those kind of things. But people are then getting a very affordable rent. You're talking about 70, 80 to 100 pounds for, you know, relatively good accommodation, five minutes from the station and on top of the university. So, you know, you can do it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Go yeah, I, I think this idea of the ladder of rents, you know, where you've got different offers mm. at different prices is, is, um, is absolutely um, vital. Um, the, accommodation that we're pr proposing, we're actually not going to ask the um, developer to, to, to build any so social space as such because we're within the, 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 in the, we're going to take responsibility for a, a hub building which will be very closely situated next to all of the rooms. Mm -hmm. um, and, but we're going to make it a very much 24-7 building so that we'll get the benefit from it as a university during the, during the daytime 
um, students get the benefits of evenings, weekends, study space, it can also support conference income, etc. But we will have to make that investment. And effectively, what we're doing is we're actually saying we, we know that if we put that in there, there'll be a capital payment that will be needed from us. So we may as well make that capital payment ourselves, take control of that, so that, so that we, it's not then subject to the sort of like the longer term agreement. If it then needs to change over time, we've got more control over that. But I think, but it, we absolutely identified that what we didn't want was just a, a, a sort of a, a vast, empty feeling, you know, a set of rooms and then maybe a few study spaces, you say, because that, was, that would be all we would be able to afford. So we've actually had to enhance that investment ourselves mm -hmm. to, to know we've got the student experience there. Okay. Right then. Did you want to...? No, no. Nope. Okay. Well, we'll move on to the no, next... Sorry, can I, yeah, go on. can I go on to another topic, which is about... Um, I think what student, how student expectations are also changing is around accessibility mm -hmm. and inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that in the past, the idea that you'd have a few inclusive, you know, um, accessible rooms and that they might be the ones that were just on the ground floor and that you couldn't then go into anybody else's room because mm -hmm. you wouldn't be able to get through the door or up the stairs or whatever. I think students are really challenging that now. Mm. I think they're saying, why do, you, why do you think it's okay to just have a few rooms that are allocated? You know, why, why are you building a kitchen where the worktops are not at the right level for everybody, mm. can't get through the door, etc. So we, we, we've had many discussions with students, and I think this is really coming through as a, as a topic that accessibility and inclusion is, is going to be incredibly important to the next generation. And whether you can offer progression as well, because it may be okay in your first year if you're an undergraduate, but then you might want to not want to stay in that yeah. same room yeah. <laughs> in exactly. years two and three exactly. with first yeah. years yeah. so it's yeah yeah okay um i will move on to the the next um kind of question we, we wanted to think about and which is about kind of collaboration and partnership between um the private sector and universities because i think we you know there's a sense on this panel that 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 will need to increase um, and that there are areas where it could improve. Um, but I think, um, what do we, um, you know, what do we, what do we think works at the moment and what are areas where we could improve or, or kind of work better together? It's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, like I, I said before, I think the, the partnership is, uh, from our perspective, is, has, has been really good and we've, we've, we've valued it and we've, I think we've learned from each other, I think, which is, which is useful over the years, but um, I think what needs to improve is a greater level of, of mutual understanding of each other's uh, uh, um, expectations. I think is that's mm -hmm. the way of putting it. I think we need. To, and again, this, I'm, I'm, I'm not criticising partners for this. I'm, I'm putting mm -hmm. that down to us really. I think we have a clearer idea now what we want from all aspects of our support services, and that includes the halls. And we can't really forget the halls. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to be clearer in our expectations of providers and partners. Um, and help them to achieve that and, and, and understand what that means. And actually, as I said before, we're, 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 I might say actually, we're certainly looking now at longer term relationships. I'm not quite sure whether there'll be a nominations agreement or release or I don't know at this stage, we, you know, all things on the table according to our finance director, although historically we've, we've not been able to go down to hard nominations because it becomes charge on the accounts and all that sort of stuff. But I think we, we, we're making the case that, the, that we might need to do things differently in the future to get what we actually need from, mm. from our partnerships and from our accommodation. Um, and within that, it might be that we, we, you know, we do set expectations about staff levels and staff, staff pay and staff, mm. staff qualifications and, and the amount to which we work together and um, even rotors and things like that, even potentially. But there's a cost to that, and we're not stupid about that. We appreciate yeah. that. But it may be rather than saying, well, okay, give us another X percent on top of the referral fee, we say, actually, let's talk about this. What, what does it cost you to do this? And mm -hmm. can we do this together? And I think, I think I, I'm, I'm fairly confident most of our partners will be totally up for that conversation. But yeah. it's, a, it's a different way of working than we've done before. But I, I can't see, I, I think the, the need to secure beds in the, in the mm. medium term is really important, particularly with the pressures coming from Manchester and Chester and Edgehill and <laughs> everywhere else onto us, potentially. If there's nothing more, there's, more, there's a need to build more, but that's probably out of our control at the moment. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think the need to, to do that, it, it nicely coincides with the, perhaps the time to reflect and, and move that forward mm. in a different way, really. And that's yeah. partly the, that's the aim of, uh, of where we are at the moment to try and mm address that um, but yeah the pressure the additional pressure on us now is the pressure from 
yes, we are in a situation where we can't take for granted that there's going to be always be a surplus of beds in the city. And, and we touched on this very briefly, but the expectations from second and third years that if they want to stay in halls, and we, we actively encourage our students to stay in halls for the whole three years, because in Liverpool, the differential between a, a house and a, a good house and a poor and one of the cheaper halls is very, very small. In fact, mm. arguably, there isn't the difference, particularly mm. now with the fuel cost and everything else that's going on. So we would like our students to stay in halls if they want to, if they want to give the option to, but it, you know, it might be the situation that a lot of students can't get their choice of hall. And how do, we, how do we help facilitate that in a way that doesn't restrict our partners from act, acting on the, the direct let market, mm -hmm. but equally gives a, a, a chance for our students to, to be reassured? Because I think that's something that's going to become an issue. You're quite right. Mm -hmm. We're not there yet. We won't be there for a, a couple of years, hopefully, if ever. But it's fine for housing the first years, but if the second years don't get what they want, right. they're ending up in poorer and poorer HMOs or, God forbid, travelling outside Liverpool to... Uh, <laughs> God knows where, what's left there now. Maybe Stoke, I don't know. <laughs> a crew. The um, North is cannibalizing itself, it's I think. Preston, really. I suppose. At the moment, it's Preston, but that, again, that won't last. Um, that would be a disastrous situation for us as well. So, mm. you know, we have to be conscious of that, really. So, uh, it, it's, it's, it's multifaceted. Yeah. It's a very interesting, very, very interesting time to yeah. be involved in this business, I think, at the moment. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd be interested. I don't know if there's what the private sector feels that, you know, universities could usefully do to help build kind of relationships and, and a kind of a useful model for you that works for you as well? Well, I, I think where it works well for us is when we have a member of um, the university's team on the board. So I'm on 25 of the special mm. purpose companies and where we have input from the university, uh, I, th I tend to think things get resolved a lot quicker and a lot more collegiately and the, the sort of university then understands what the you know, the SPV is actually facing in a, in a practical sense. Um, I think the private sector could be better at um, understanding the different plates that the universities are spinning. I think they often uh, just think about the accommodation angle and they're not thinking how can we resolve other issues. So that shell and core discussion that you're having about how do you provide academic or social space, but without, you know, um, using residential accommodation to pay for that in, in some way. I think that's, uh, that's going to be a very important uh, way forward. Um, and also, I think it's good to, you know, you need to be honest and transparent, and there are difficult discussions to be had, and we've had plenty of those over the COVID period, I can assure you, and it, and it hasn't been easy at all, but, you know, it's a long-term long -term game. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Jane, is there anything you wanted to say? Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes the challenge is, it's say, for instance, if you look at Glasgow, is that we're working with lots of different universities, and so we get pulled and pushed in all sorts of different directions, and everyone wants something <coughs> different. So it's getting some consistency from the university in the way they approach us as well. Mm. And I think, you know, understanding the pressures that we have. So whilst universities will have pressures, we have pressures as well um, for our investors. Um, and, you know, there is only so much we can do mm -hmm. to, um, you know, to meet those demands on both sides. I think as an organisation, we worked really, really hard on the customer experience, the resident experience, um, sometimes at our detriment, because I will get criticised by clients that that's too much of a focus rather than the bottom line for them, but that's, that's the ethos that we have. Um, but I think yeah, universities need to come, I think, and have a look at actually what do we do. And mm. We aren't institutional, um, mm. but we do offer, I think, a really good service. And so maybe don't have a look at what you do, maybe have a look at what we do, and is that a different way of delivering a really good service as well? Mm. It doesn't have to be the same. Mm -hmm. um, so. okay. I, mean, I definitely come from this, I mean, absolutely, I would agree. I can perspective. I've never, I would say this in, in presentations of, I've never managed student accommodation. I've never, we never, as a university, haven't managed accommodation for years. So we absolutely do recognise that the, that the accommodation providers, the PBSA providers, are brilliant at managing the bricks and mortar as a business and very, very efficiently, I think, compared to, I think, many universities actually. But it's the extra stuff on top I think we need to work, work on really. The other thing I just want to say very briefly as well, which is another co complicating factor, is we talked this morning about the, 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 the information sharing with, with partners. Now, we have an agreement with our current nine partners that we, we have worked with, and um, we have an information sharing agreement as part of that. We are obviously reviewing that at the moment. That's all fine. So if anything happens in one of their partner halls, they let us know, we can deal with it, it's fine. But actually, we, we actually, in the city of Liverpool, I think there are some like 18, 19, probably 20 mm -hmm. um, actual PBSA providers, all of which are housing John Moore students. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I've been asked to do is to look at how do we engage with the rest of those in a way that brings them in? And, 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 and to be fair, I think 
the, the feedback so far has been, yeah, absolutely, even though we're not a direct partner, we don't have a, not a referral agreement with you or I think actually we want to keep that dialogue going, making the rest of the university understand that you know, it's not just these halls that can, can send their instant report, it's actually everybody, yeah. that's a challenge, but actually they're our students. We have to deal with that, we, have to, we can't say, oh well, we can deal with that because it's in that hall, but actually the hall over the road, we're not dealing with that. And I mean, Fresh is a good example, we're not currently an official partner with Fresh, but we do have a good relationship and Fresh, the managers know where to get hold of us and we have that yeah. contact already and that's, that, that's really helpful. But um, we probably need to formalise that as well and that's another layer of complexity in a sense and, yeah. and we're, we're there doing that other institutions in the city are not even thinking about that yet so that's again it's, it's not this, this that's where the providers struggle I think isn't it where you've got yeah. a university that's quite engaged mm -hmm. and, and, and just down the road at a very similar institution that's not and they're, they're, they're housing half students from this university and half from that university so if they're flat, if they have five times in the flat, right, that's easy. If it happens in that flat, oh no, it's them, I can't, I can't even, what do I do about it, you know? Yeah. And that can't be easy for the providers either. So, you know, I think we have to be, you yeah. know, recognise that. I think that's very right. <coughs> is, um, you know, we do have um, some really good relationships with universities across the UK. Um, and that does work well, especially when we've got concerns with individual students uh, with mental health or other issues. I think, I think we've got more universities that don't engage and whilst we don't have a lot of nominations or lease agreements right across the country, we've got a sm very small number, we actually want to um, work well with universities. We want to align our uh, you know, processes and you know, our welfare and you know, have it feel like it's joined up, make sure that students understand what's available to them. Even finding out how to signpost sometimes is a real struggle. Um, so you know, it's not that we necessarily want to have anything given to us for free or to be favoured or anything like that, but it, it is for the benefit of the student that we try to make it to, yeah. to engage and that doesn't always happen, which is sad really. Yeah. And, and students and their parents would expect it and would find it yeah. bizarre yeah. that, that yeah. there isn't even a kind of a working communication yeah. between I think, people. I think that's, I don't <coughs> totally agree with everything that's been said, I'm on the same page um, as Ed. You know, in Bournemouth, we, we, we've been working hard to, to get that collaborative approach. You know, we've got data sharing agreements in place with our nominations partners. We're just rolling out the data sharing protocol with our, with, with our um, uh, direct let uh, providers here, in, you know, including Fresh. So, um, so you know, it, it, it can be done. Mm. And, 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 and if, if Liverpool can do it, if Bournemouth can do it, there's no reason why other universities can't do it as well. Mm. And, and, and actually, and I, what, what really I'm really pleased about is that you know um, that Edward um, is taking on this piece mm. of work, and I know he's working with Unipol and he's working with Cubo, um, and and hopefully what will come out in the new year will be will be something that that actually will be able to other universities will be able to take away and look at and say actually okay I think we can do this. Yep. One of the big challenges though I think and what I hear a lot is that universities have got internal challenges themselves, which I don't think private providers, all private providers necessarily completely understand, mm. and that's that internally universities see themselves as separate entities. Mm. So student services won't share with security or estates won't share with welfare team, you yeah. know, and it, it, it's, it's just, it, it doesn't make any sense, mm -hmm. you know, there's no reason why they shouldn't be doing that, they're one entity, they're one data mm -hmm. controller. So, you know, I think that's, that's a big hurdle that a lot of universities first need to have a, an internal conversation and get over that because until they get over that they're never going to be able to to start no. engaging with the private sector yeah. no you've got to get the gear own house in order first haven't yeah. you really yeah okay well, i'm going to move on to the final topic that we wanted to talk about um on this panel which was affordability and the cost of living and then after this maybe five minutes here and then we'll open up for some questions and have about 15 minutes left for that so really thinking about um, affordability and what universities and providers do to understand their, what is affordable for students in, their, in local markets. And then, you know, is there anything that's possible? What's working? Is anything making a difference at the moment, do we think? Can I jump in on yeah, that one? Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I just sorry. wanted to share um, just, just uh, um, uh, some, some data. So we, we um, surveyed all of our incoming first year students um, to, to get an idea of what their biggest concerns were and where they felt they were, um, were lacking in, mm -hmm. in, in sort of um, 
the, the, the skills that they need to sort of transition into this new independent life. Anyway, that was, the, that was kind of the survey. So we got a lot of data out of that, but one of the really interesting things was we asked them whether they, um, whether at that point, this was in, I think it was in June before the September, we asked them whether they thought they would need additional funding. Um, and 54% of them said yes. So 54% of them already knew before they'd even arrived that they needed additional funding. Mm. And then we said, for those students who said yes, we then went on to say, where are you going to get this additional funding from? Only 5% said that they would be able to get that from a parental contribution. 84% said they're going to have to find work. Mm. So even before they've arrived, they know they're going to be short. So that's, 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 the, prob that's the level of the problem. Yeah, uh, yeah Unipol's done some, re some similar research and asking students if you have to work, how many hours are you having to work? And I think something like 15 or 20 percent of the students said they're working 30 hours a week to cover their basic living costs. This is a small sample just in Leeds, um, but I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's a big challenge. And I, I'm really interested to know if anybody has anything that any um, solutions or things that they think are, are, are useful contributions because I think we acknowledge that we can't solve this for everybody but is there anything targeted that people are doing or they think is, is making a difference? I think it's difficult um, how we can make a difference but you know the surveys that we've done and some of the anecdotal evidence that we're getting is that you know the, our last survey was saying that most of our students were seeing that um, the accommodation and what we offered actually was good value. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the reason it's seen as good value is one, it's, it's obviously a fixed all-inclusive cost. Um, so people kind of know how to budget and know what they need to look for. So in, especially now with utilities going up with HMO, that's an unknown factor. But I think um, what we're seeing is, is people taking advantage 24-7. Mm -hmm. um, the facilities a lot more now, which is something you didn't see maybe three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. So we often see a lot more parties, a lot more dinner parties, mm -hmm. a lot more events that are organised by students on site. Mm -hmm. We had um, a really big, uh, we've got a really big kind of almost like a house type, a party type house where we've got different um, social spaces in Liverpool and study rooms and things like that. A lot of girls will book that out on a Friday and a Saturday night because they're frightened of going out um, mm. in the locality for the spiking, but also it's now being used as a cheaper way of going out. So they've got a sound system that goes right through the house, um, play music, they bring their food, their drink, and you know we just have to clear up in the morning. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they've all had a, an amazing time, but that's a cheaper way. They're not paying the higher prices to go out clubbing and the drinks costs and things like that. So we are seeing our spaces being used 24-7. Mm -hmm. We're seeing our gyms being used 24-7. You can go into gyms at four in the morning and they're in use mm -hmm. um, because students kind of have a different clock mm -hmm. and they feel safe within the building. They can wander around. They go, you know, from, from space to space without feeling you know, under threat or um, at risk at all. And I think that's why they see it. And then on top of that, we offer the kind of the B programme, the support, the events. So they're getting a lot of stuff for free. Um, and they're seeing that as they're getting more than the accommodation overall. Okay. I, I think the employment things is really interesting because although lots of universities are publishing headlines at the moment about the fact they're putting more money into hardship funds. and But when you then work out how much that is per student, it doesn't really come mm -hmm. to very much, even if there are some quite big numbers being mentioned by particular universities. But I think that the employment is interesting. So we joined the Unitemps mm -hmm. um, franchise arrangement several years ago. And, it, and when it started out, it was very much get finding jobs for students mm -hmm. in probably in sort of filling stations and shops. And mm -hmm. But we have then through a series of projects that we did internally to actually then gen generate um, opportunities for students to work with um, SMEs. Mm -hmm. So we're actually, so by increasing, so, so by having some projects that we actually raised money for and we were then able to pay the students to do the work, but that then enhanced our relationships with those employers. Mm -hmm. And we're now able to also get, independent of that, just better paid opportunities for students. So we see it as one of the things is if they're going to be working, then also it should be something that's going to be contributing. I mean, I'm not saying it's, it's not 100% of the answer, but at least it's giving people mm. something else as well, that if they are going to be working, at least it's something meaningful towards their, 
their CV. Yeah, great. There's a point here about formal preparation so students know what they're expecting. Mm. Um, we've just finished some work with Gen, some Gen Z research and uh, it was interesting that um, those we, we put out a theoretical question about whether we thought £250 in London was a, you know, a fair rent. And actually the, the applicants or the people who hadn't got to university, about 40, 45% of them said they thought it was reasonable, but obviously only about 10 to 15% of those who actually faced mm. it. So mm. the reality yeah. of it is starkly different. Mm. Um, so I think a bit of, bit of extra prep in, in that transition mm. from uh, college or school to university would be quite helpful. The other thing that's still out there is, is actually the, the policy angle. Um, mm -hmm. So um, nobody's talking about maintenance. This is not a self-serving point, but nobody's mm -hmm. talking about what's going to happen um, with uh, maintenance loans. Uh, or grants, and uh, there's been no discussion in terms of the, the new bill that's likely to come uh, mm. through the House uh, about that either. So I think that really needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it feels like it's a, it's a bit of a missing point from NUS yeah. on this, really. It's a yeah, I think the, the, the maintenance loan is, I mean, ultimately that's where the majority of the, the students' funding comes from. And, and you know, you've seen various data coming out, you know, the Combination Cost Survey mm. last year and other data that's come out since. You know, we, we know that the the maintenance loan just gets eaten up mm. in sort of average rents now. Mm -hmm. um, so students just don't have the money to, 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 to pay the rent without getting additional support. Mm -hmm. So it is a huge problem, um, you know, um, but it should, it, it does need to be addressed, but there's, there's, there's so many different elements, isn't there, that mm -hmm. around, around this, every, you know, everything's, everything's going up in cost. Um, so, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Yeah. I absolutely don't know what the no. answer is. I mean, accommodation bursaries. People talk about accom targeted accommodation bursaries, mm -hmm. which can help um, for for universities that have got, you know, po po considerable pots of money for for bursaries and hardship loans. Not all universities do mm -hmm. that, you know. And my de the the fear around accommodation bursaries is that you're sort of robbing Peter to pay Paul. You're just mm -hmm. taking it away from other mm -hmm. students who, you know. Because that's what universi universities have to make a decision where they're directing their money. If they take it away from you know, to, to put into bursaries, then someone else, another student's going to suffer. Mm -hmm. So it's it's one option. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not the answer though. Mm. Okay. I think I think um, we're looking at quite a few things at the moment. We've got a big report going to our executive team on Tuesday, which I'm, I'm contributed to. And there's lots of ideas about things which we do currently, which make no sense in the current climate. We offer scholarships, for example, which are great, but the vast majority of the students, we don't, we don't get applications for scholarships that we should do anymore. Why not just get rid of that and give it the additional student support funds or targeted bursaries on this, or increase the threshold by which our, we pay out, we, we, we run a few universities, universities still pay a bursary to students. Currently, the students under the, the lowest, um, the, get the maximum student loan, get a bursary. Perhaps we can increase that threshold, because actually, it's not those students, if, certainly from our perspective, very often it's not the students who on the maximum funding are actually struggling, it's the students in the middle bracket, the 35, 45, 50,000 mm. pound household income where their the amount of loan they get is massively reduced, mm. but the ability of parents or guardians to make up that difference is very, very limited. Um, mm. but, but perhaps they had a relatively, but they may not have been students who are used to working because they had a relatively comfortable home life actually, mm. whereas some of the students in poor backgrounds have. So it's a, but one good, one bright point, point in news we've had, we are the biggest institute, biggest, recruiter of Northern Irish students outside of Glasgow Caledonian, I think mm -hmm. outside of Queens and Belfast, and that, of course that was a, that was a surprise and a very, very pl pleasing change to the Northern Irish funding of the week, so that, because they currently, the, the student support fund is almost becoming like a Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland bursary because they've, so many of those students are coming in, just their funding has been just appalling and they've really struggled, but, but I take the point that, that very much agree with you about the point about pre-arrival information and mm -hmm. making sure students are prepared for what they're going into, and parents as well, it's still, it's still surprises me and depresses me how many parents you come to open days and you're talking through I don't go involved in accommodation the f funding so much but they, they don't have a, have a sense that they're expected to find five thousand pounds or six thousand mm. pounds to help their student and, and equally the Welsh students don't have to find that money and they, they're, they're, they're just a surprise so clearly there's a, le there's a level of, of and it's not our fault or it's, it's a what I know Martin Lewis has been talking about this for a long time but they, the level of 
of understanding of parental understanding of, of the, how the system works is still surprisingly low. And we're still getting a lot of students coming through who are first generation going to university. And even those whose parents went to university don't still don't seem to understand it. And I don't know how we tackle that one really. That will help, I think. Yeah. The only accommodation, the only, we, we're very lucky. We have some shared, we have a very good range of prices and we're very, relatively cheap compared to just about anywhere in the country, the big cities. We have some shared bathroom accommodation, uh, which is 80, 80 pounds a week at the moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, including all the bills, it's actually really nice accommodation. Yeah. That's the only hall that didn't sell out this year. So, how, you know, how does that work? How does it? How, how does that figure in a cost of living crisis? Why is our cheapest, very good accommodation not selling out, but the most expensive is? You know, it makes no okay, sense, but right. it sort of does. Sorry. On that point, the eternal conundrum. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Why does the most expensive stuff go first? I'm going to move it over. I'm going to open up to some questions because everybody's been very patient, and I, I, I wonder if there are some questions. Oh, Simon, over here. <coughs> Hi, that was very insightful. So it's Iram here from Brunel University. Um, so we had a debt problem with accommodation for a number of years. And just something to show how we tackled it is we introduced a debt management policy. So what our team does now is financial arrangements where we actually offer like support and advice to students. And what we found is our debt collection was about 70%. Mm -hmm. We've now gone up to 95%, a uh, significant difference in debt collection. And that's mainly due to just engaging with students. And what we found is they want like higher priced accommodation because they like the luxury, but they don't know how to manage their finances. But having the conversations with them and, and invoking the policy, we've now introduced them like payment plans. So we normally have like termly installments, which they can't afford. So when they get their student loan, which is a lot of money, they just get all excited and like, they're like, just like, this could blow it out. Mm. So what we're finding is with our debt management policy that we've introduced, that's actually making the students feel a bit more secure that they can engage with us and they mm. can actually talk to us because I think there's a lack of um, support there. Like students just come into accommodation, there's no advice there. And I think it could be something that we <coughs> need to proactively do as mm. well. It's not just they can't afford it, they, they can, they just need some guidance. Mm. Okay. Thank you, that's really yeah. interesting. Um, just, just to say on that, we, we, we've always taken the view, whereas if we could, any of our partners could, re, could report students to us or raise these students' concerns to us, one thing we, what we said we wouldn't do is get involved in helping them chase the debts, but at, rental debts, but actually we found, we've started to do that in a limited way now, because actually it, it is our problem as much as it is the hall's problem. So actually if, it, if, a, if a student hasn't paid the rent, we can't force that, we can't make the student pay the rent, but the fact they haven't paid the rent, we need to know about it. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a trial, trial at the moment, but it's quite a significant change for us really. And I think again, it's something that helps the, the providers, I think, to a certain extent as well, because it, it is everybody's problem ultimately. But you're right, it's unfortunate. The problem is, uh, as much as you, as you try, it's probably only until they actually get here that they realise they don't know where to manage money, do they? And it, we've said before, it's a, it's, a, it's a crazy situation that these people who've, I mean, I, I, always, I always hate how I used to have to go and try and do presentations to applicants and say, try and, try and work out a budget over three months and knowing that every month I'm scraping the last few, few days away trying to get, get to the next payday because I'm massively overdrawn. So how, how can I lecture 18 year olds on how to manage your money over three months? Well, like most people, like a lot of people maybe, I can't manage my money over a month, but that's the, that's the stupidity of the system, isn't it, I think? Yeah. We've, we've, um, I mean, we've introduced a, a similar system in Bournemouth as well where it, it came to light actually last year with a, a student from two years ago who, who, who um, kind of, their parents contacted the university because they weren't happy with, the, with, with what had happened. And it turned out that this, this student had, had, had been amassing rental arrears all year and, and had been, all we've been doing is just sending out the standard letters to them and just allowing that debt to accrue until the end of the year when it then got passed up to, you know, through the escalation process and ended up with him getting a county court judgment. Um, and, and it turned out that he was addicted to gambling. And, 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 and actually, what we've, so now what we've done is that we're working with, when we're getting to the end of sort of the arrears process, any, any, and it's only a small number, we're actually very good at collecting debt, um, is, but the, that very small number, with them, our residential life team are reaching out to them and having a conversation with them to find out what's, what's behind the reason. So we're doing that on a sort of a termly basis, um, just to sort of have sort of a, a check-in really to make sure they're managing their money, and if they're not, then what's behind that? 
that's that, that's something that we're hoping is going to going to really help. And we're doing that for our for our partners as well as, as well as our own managed properties. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because I think when we see students get into debt. Um, and they'll often avoid us, obviously, when they're in debt. So it's even though we're working in the building, they live in the building um, that we're working in, um, it's hard to track them down. But often there is an underlying other issue that's going on. It's not just about them not wanting to pay their rent. So where um, we've had really good relationships with universities and we've been able to have that conversation um, about rent with the university, actually you know the issues are minimized because then we unpick the types of issues that robin just talked about here and can come up with a plan um, and we have lots of monthly payment plans on our on our, on our uh, portfolio okay great does anybody have any other questions about any of the other topics that we've talked about this morning um this morning today oh is there one on there one from our, one of our online attendees. It says, does affordable accommodation have to mean poor quality slash old stock? And what solutions do people see coming forward? <coughs> I think affordability, that word affordability, you know, if everybody, people say that and you're, the, the person's right, you know, people automatically think cheap. It's, affordability means the cheapest. And, and I don't think, I think, I think that, um, there's a lot of work to be done to try and understand what affordability means. Uh, that, that I think universities are actually quite well placed to, to do that work if they're willing, because they've got they've 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 got the, they've got enough data to to be able to to kind of model the financial profiles of their students. I don't think many universities are doing that, and I think that it's it's a piece, it is a piece of work they've started doing at Bournemouth. It's quite a big piece of work, but it can be done. Um, and, and I think once you understand your financial profile of your students, you can then have an informed view about what that means with regards to the rental levels within the portfolio that presents itself in front, whether it's HMO, whether it's private PBSA, whether it's your own portfolio. And I think you'll be in a much better position then to be able to then, <coughs> to then take a view, an informed view of what is affordable for certain types of students based upon their financial profile, because they'll all be different. And I think you'll find that, you'll probably find that different universities, different parts of the country, that it will differ. And there will be similarities. <laughs> yeah, we did some uh, research a couple of years ago where we looked at for five years of data, um, uh, demand data. Um, and yeah, we cut it by mission group and we cut it by institution. And, you know, some of the findings are very interesting. So most of the, so the, the desire and demand for ensuite accommodation was in uh, post-92 universities, was far stronger in post-92. Um, and uh, in Russell group, it was a bit more, you know, didn't, didn't mind the, the sort of standard accommodation, old, older type of accommodation. So uh, you need to really get, you need to get under the surface of what that demand looks like because what's affordable for somebody is, you know, is obviously a moving feast. It also presupposes there is a direct correlation between price and quality and there, and there isn't. I mean, I, I, I'd argue, and I was actually arguing on Wednesday, or well, not arguing, but persuading applicants to go and look at Marybone One and say, look, if you, for £80, pound, £85 pounds next year, sorry, um, you get a big room, a sink in the room, and there's six of you sharing two bathrooms. And then nearly double that, round the corner, you get a, a, a bathroom in your room, a smaller room, same kitchen lounge area, it looks nice and it looks shiny, but actually, you get less space. What, what actually are you, are you missing out on? But unfortunately, I think because, like, in a similar way to universities, a very hard good or service to assess, it, students do fall back on, if that's more expensive, that must be better. And that's, I think, a, a real mm -hmm. difficulty, really. And I think, and I, I actually don't think that's what's happening in, in, our, in, our, in our portfolio. I think those halls that are more expensive are because the bill costs were more expensive. But mm. you know, there's almost like, if you, there's, there's an element to which if you put the price up on something, in some accommodation, you actually get more demand rather than less because students, particularly first years, find it very hard to, to judge that, really. So, yeah, but we definitely need to try and... I know maybe that we are at the start of a, a change. I did, I did notice towards the end of our last allocation cycle that although the really expensive halls went really quickly, in, that, in the latter period, going from sort of May to, to August, there was a shift and some of the cheaper, slightly good value on suite halls, not the, not the share bathroom, the good value on suite halls were outperforming where we thought they would be compared to the more expensive on suite. So there, there might be the signs of, of a change of perception now for the cost of living, but um, we'll, have, we'll just have to wait and see how that, how that operates, really. 
think the other thing that we try to do is have lots of price points. So, you know, whilst it might be the same accommodation, is to always have some rooms that are at the more affordable end of the price range that we have. So in our buildings, we'll often have between five and sometimes 25 different price points. So it kind of, you know, there's a big range of people. And in theory, well, you know, in theory, you know, the rooms are probably not that much different. Um, so, you know, there is an affordable, but I get um, what we say, was just said because I think students now have got this Instagram thing in their heads and want to have something that looks shiny, new, somewhere where they can take photos of themselves. So, you know, simple things like having a big mirror with good lighting is so important. You take them into one of our own suites and they've got strip lighting around it. It's the, the bee's knees and that's it. They've, they've bought the, the, the room sort of thing. So, you know, they, it sounds very superficial, but it, that, um, unfortunately, that seems to be the way of the world. It's not for me, but <laughs> it seems to be that generation there is, there at the is, moment. There is, I mean, there's, there's a case there to answer, though, isn't there, around, like, you know, that's what, that's what the marketing is showing. That's, your, you know, you're kind of just you're reinforcing their preconceptions and their expectations and saying, actually, yeah, this is what <coughs> you to come here. Mm. And, and so, you know, I think it's, it's multifaceted, but I, I, I do go back to... I go back to, you, you can't, you know, you can say like, oh, let's have a conversation, let's try and educate students before they arrive, let's try to talk. I don't think you can do that until you really understand what affordable means for your university. And you've got to work out your student's financial profile to do that. You've got to do that work. Otherwise, you're talking about, oh, we've got more affordable rooms. But what does that mean? What does that mean? That means, like, it's affordable for, you know, it's way affordable for someone, you know, who's kind of, you know, son of a millionaire. Um, and, but it's, 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 not, it's totally not affordable for somebody who's coming from a single parent family, you know, on benefits, and they can't, you know, even though it's your most affordable room, it's still not affordable yeah. for them. That's true. So, you know, it's this term for affordable, it's, a, mm. it's, it's such a you know, nuanced mm -hmm. word, um, and I think we need to stop using it until we can properly define it. <laughs> understand your students, yes. understand your customers. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, thank you. I'm going to... Uh, bring it to a close there because we have uh, reached 2.15. But thank you so much to our panellists for sharing your time and thinking about the topic in advance and preparing some thoughts. We really appreciate it. I hope it's been interesting and useful to you too as well. We now have time on the agenda for a short break and then we will be splitting into some further parallel sessions. So thank you very much for your questions and we'll see you uh, in a few minutes. Thank you.